Hi, in this video we are going to talk about some of the common monetary policy tools that any central bank uses in order to manage the money supply and interest rates in the economy. The name monetary policy comes from the idea that the central bank is trying to manage the money supply in the economy. How does the central bank manage the money supply in the economy? Usually by using the tools of interest rates. So if interest rates are increased in the economy, the idea of raising rates is to ensure that money supply goes down. As money supply goes down, you are going to curb the growth and usually curbing the growth is not the idea. You are trying to essentially control inflation in the economy. right? That's why you would increase rates or interest rates in that context. If you have cut down interest rates, that is essentially to ensure that money supply goes up. Money supply going up would mean people would be able to borrow money, businesses would be able to borrow money and invest, people would be able to borrow money and spend and that would result in growth going up. Eventually, at some point of time, this will lead to inflation also going up. But the initial idea of cutting interest rates is to ensure that growth increases. So you would note that you know in the post-pandemic world, immediately after the global growth kind of went down, suddenly all central banks in Unison cut rates to ensure that global growth picks up again. And the idea here was to ensure that you know if there is sort of global GDP contraction that's happening because of the lockdowns around pandemic, the economy should be able to pull out because of consumer spending or business investment that could be catalyzed by lower interest rates in the economy. So that's how typically central bank policies end up working. That's how the idea of central bank policies uh, comes into picture. There are a variety of tools, however, that the central bank can use to ensure this interest rate movement in the economy. Right? Our idea in this video is to look at what all those tools are. So let's try and take them one by one. We start with something called as reserve ratios. What are reserve ratios? Commonly used reserve ratios, there are two kinds of reserve ratios. There is something called as CRR, which is cash reserve ratio. And there's something called as SLR, which is statutory liquidity ratio. What do you mean by them and why, is that, why are they needed? If you think about a bank, essentially, a bank necessarily takes deposits from depositors and then loans out this money at the other end. Right? So depositors give money to the bank, the bank loans, loans this money out. The problem with this approach is the depositors are essentially looking at parking money for a shorter period of time, whereas the borrowers have taken money for a longer period of time. Right? Home loans, car loans, almost all of these are longer tenure loans. To ensure that there's liquidity available for depositors at all points of time, the central bank comes and says that out of every 100 rupees that is deposited here, some part has to be kept as cash that's about 4% in India at this point of time. And some part has to be kept in the form of very liquid bonds, usually government bonds that can be sold at any point of time. Roughly 18% of the money is kept here. So approximately out of this 100 rupees, 22% or 22 rupees will be kept aside as reserve ratios by any bank. Why is that needed? Because if tomorrow as a depositor I go to a bank and I tell the bank, please give me my money, the bank should have enough cash or resources to be able to give me money when needed, right? That's the context of reserve ratios. Now think about it, if reserve ratios go up, then this 22% will go up. That will mean the bank will have lesser money to lend out, which will result in money supply going down. When money supply goes down, interest rates automatically go up. Money supply going down is a simple demand supply economics that is playing out. If supply of money goes down, cost of money will go up. Cost of money is the interest rate, right? Same opposite of this is when you cut down reserve ratios, right? Money supply would go up, interest rates would go down. This is something that was again done right as the pandemic started and uh, RBI had cut down CRR and SLR at that point of time. Having said that, in the recent past, RBI hasn't really touched CRR, SLR too much in order to manage the interest rates, right? These are tools that exist, but they haven't really gone down the path of using them very often for managing interest rates in the economy. Most of the times, what RBI uses is what is called as the policy rates, right? Which is the repo rate that we have heard of. Now, policy rates usually are signaling mechanisms by the central bank to banks in the economy that they want rates to go up or go down. How does this work? The term itself is called repo rate, which stands for repurchase agreement. RBI essentially gives money to banks for the shorter period on this repo rate. But the money is not given only as direct money as a loan. The bank actually sells 
some bonds right or securities to the RBI with the promise that they are going to repurchase these bonds at a later point of time thereby returning the money to RBI and the amount paid back to RBI is the initial amount borrowed plus the interest rate as defined by the repo rate right that's why the term repurchase option comes into the picture the bank here when they are returning the money are going to pay this repo rate so essentially this is the money that RBI makes on the loans they have given for shorter periods to banks when the RBI raises repo rate the cost of borrowing for the bank goes up the signal RBI is giving to the bank is that look I am increasing the rate that I'm going to charge you so you also need to increase the rate that you are going to charge to your customers that's the signal the problem however is that banks don't necessarily borrow a large part of their money from RBI this is a limited amount they are taking on repo right bulk of their money is coming from the deposit base so technically there is no real need for the bank to immediately transmit this rate hike similarly if the RBI cuts rates there is no real need for the bank to immediately cut rates this issue with transmission of rates was why RBI came up with policies that on floating rate loans you will have repo link loans as an option that is available so now if you go to a bank for a floating rate loan you could get that rate linked to the repo rate so when the repo rate goes up or down you can effectively get the loan rate changed as well the exact opposite of this is reverse repo when banks have excess money which they are parking with the RBI they will put the money at something called as reverse repo where the RBI pays interest to the bank at this point of time repo rate in India at the time of recording this video is 4% and reverse repo is 3.35% this difference has widened during the pandemic usually earlier this difference used to be 25 basis points from from the perspective of repo and reverse repo so that's the policy rates once again these are signaling mechanisms because RBI is telling the banking system that look I am increasing rates or I am cutting rates please do the same at the back end with your customers as well so that's the idea of the repo rate the third in this picture comes open market operations or what is commonly known as OMOs in OMOs the central bank is basically directly buying or selling bonds right now why would you do that remember if the central bank buys bonds what they are going to do is they are going to push liquidity into the system which will mean money supply will go up and consequently interest rates will come down in other words when you buy a bond the bond price goes up we know that bond prices and yields are inversely related so when bond prices go up yields come down and when yields come down that's effectively interest rates coming down on the contrary when RBI sells bonds they will take out money supply from the market they will suck out liquidity from the market which causes cost of money to go up why would the central bank do an open market operation in any economy is to ensure that market interest rates remain in line with what they want them to be see RBI can go and set a benchmark interest rate saying this should be 4% it does not however ensure that in the interbank market or in the financial services segment in this financial market two entities are lending to each other at that same rate that could depend entirely on what market conditions are to ensure that that market liquidity condition remains in line with what RBI wants the rates to be RBI might actually choose to intervene in the market if the liquidity is too high RBI will buy bonds if the liquidity is low RBI will sell bonds in that market right this context is where open market operations come into picture the idea is to ensure that there is interest rate sort of range the interest rate lies in the range or interest rate management is what is the idea money supply is what they are trying to manage using open market operations it's important to understand this objective of where this is coming from because there's another thing that RBI does which is very similar and we'll discuss that in a minute so that's about open market operations the next bit that RBI could come in and do is they could have direct regulations which is they could come in and say that okay I want to sort of reduce the cost of borrowing for a particular sector so there has to be a certain amount of lending that has to be done to a particular sector RBI can come and define that right so that automatically what it does it reduces the cost of borrowing for that particular sector the final bit is something called as asset purchases now asset purchases are slightly tricky because even in this what's happening is bonds are being bought right there's bond buying that's happening so it's in a actual transaction sense not very different from open market operations right however the key here 
is the objective why are you buying these bonds you are buying these bonds to ensure that you support the bond markets now sometimes what can happen is in financial markets you know because of liquidity issues because of general fear scare in the in the market that kind of comes in you could have a scenario where the markets get broken and these bonds tend to become illiquid in such a case because finance is such an interlinked system globally it could cause systemic issues in the in the financial services landscape to ensure that the system does not freeze up the central bank will come and say okay i will buy these bonds right take an example in a uh, year like 2018 in india ilnfs had defaulted on some of its bonds at that point of time if another infrastructure finance agency comes and issues bonds there is going to be a little bit of trouble in terms of you know people investing in those bonds because they are they are afraid they're not really they're not really sure if the money is going to come back right at this point if the central bank comes and says we are going to buy these bonds suddenly the market demand for these bonds goes up because uh, now people believe that you know worst case i can eventually give it to rbi and rbi will honor the commitment around that right so this bond buying the objective here is to support bond markets the most sort of commonly heard term we have heard around this is what is called as quantitative easing which most of these global central banks have been doing you know actually post the subprime crisis in 2008 so the us has been running sort of the longest running quantitative easing easing program where they have been buying you know us government treasuries uh, the central bank the us fed has been buying treasuries uh, for a long long while what that has done is to support the bond markets they've kept doing it which resulted in a lot of liquidity flowing into the market that liquidity has gone into all kinds of asset classes and now started sort of creating a huge inflationary issue at least that is one of the key contributing factors for the huge inflation uh data points that we are seeing across the world at this point of time which is what is causing now the us markets or us uh, fed to go ahead and say that they are going to stop this quantitative easing they are going to reverse the entire policy and they are also going to increase interest rates right so quantitative easing is nothing but basically going and purchasing these bonds till about a few months back the us fed was actually buying somewhere in the range of 20 to 40 billion dollars of treasury securities every month this amount was going into financial markets and then used you know being lent out or you know getting invested eventually or finding its way eventually into various kinds of risk assets across the world right so that in a nutshell is a bunch of the major monetary policy tools that are there the key difference in some of these for example open market and asset purchases is to ensure what is the core objective there remember a central bank's core objective at any given point of time is to ensure price stability and growth right when i say price stability this means inflation and growth is essentially growth in the economy this is the twin objective that any central bank is carrying out at any given point of time and almost all the policy tools are used keeping these two in mind one caveat however is that if a central bank in steady times has to choose between price stability and growth they will almost always go and choose price stability right or historically that used to be the case that's been one of the key debatable points in the very recent past with respect to this quantitative easing but we'll see what the impacts of that are that in a nutshell is the bunch of monetary policy tools that are being used at this point of time by various central banks that's it in this particular video thank you